Telling the other people in our spheres of influence about Jesus' work in our lives, watch this, it is not a complex maneuver. For whatever reason, many people who perch on church chairs every week think that sharing their testimony or being a witness for Christ, they, they've been talked into believing, been duped into believing that it is something that is very difficult, very difficult thing, and something that you can't even do unless you've been to cemetery, or near, seminary. Lord God, you know all my way. turning us on, tuning us in. I trust as always that the Lord's going to bless you up one side and down the other as we fellowship together here for the next several moments. I'm pretty excited to be able to share this message, this particular teaching with you tonight. It's actually the conclusion of a very long series that we've been dealing with here for many weeks, but this deals with the issue of evangelism, sharing the gospel with those in your sphere of influence. Now, I realize that uh, when you're coming through the medium of television or social media, as the case might be, I'm probably speaking to some people who are believers and you're trying to understand, learn some things about the Word and being challenged uh, to know some things about the Word. And I'm talking about the Bible when I say the Word. There are others of you that are listening because you're either curious or you're, you stumbled upon uh, this particular teaching or this uh, video, as the case might be. Maybe by accident, but I don't think things happen by accident. I believe in divine appointments. I think you're here for a reason, giving us a listen for a reason. We're going to be talking to you tonight about sharing the gospel. Now, if you haven't become a follower of Christ, it's very important that you understand before you can share something, you have to have something. Before you can share the gospel, you have to know of or partake of the gospel and that means you need to be born again. Perhaps I'll talk to you a little bit more about that at the end of the telecast tonight. We're going to jump right into the teaching now, and I trust that those of you who know Jesus as your Lord and Savior would be challenged to share the message, share the gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, that you would be challenged to share that with others. It's not as difficult as you may have been led to believe and I trust that will come shining through in this particular teaching. Our text for this, uh, this series has been Hebrews chapter 13. But I want to read an additional scripture in your hearing tonight. And we're going to jump right into this. And this is found in Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse 9. The record puts it this way. But if I say, I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name. His word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. The writer says, I can't hold this in. There's something inside of me is like a fire trying to get out. I can't contain it. Well, I'm excited to be able to tell you about that tonight. I resemble that remark. I think I know what he's talking about. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for each and every one that's turned on the telecast, this particular teaching, and I pray that in the power of the Spirit, you would speak to hearts, challenge us to live out your word. We pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hey, you hang on. I'm going to be back here in just a little while to wrap things up. I've got a couple of really exciting things to tell you before we do. God bless you. I've been doing two things. First of all, glancing back at some of our history, some of the history of New Life Community Church as we have celebrated 20 years here in this area. We're in our 21st year of incarnational ministry. And we've been looking back at that in order to help remind us of that which is to be our focus for the future. And it's very important you understand this. We haven't been looking back talking about the good old days. I haven't been challenging you. Hey, y'all, let's go back and do things like we did 20 years ago. Not that at all. It's very similar to Jacob's dream. That's why this big old rock 
is up here. In fact, after today, I'm going to take that back home and put it in my riprap pile, I think. But you remember Jacob went to sleep one night and he drug up a big old rock and made a pillow out of it. What a pillow. During the night, he had a spirit-inspired vision or a dream, and it was spirit-inspired. It was from God, and it was very important. So important that he decided the next day to turn that pillow into a pillar, and it served as a reminder of that dream. And that's where we get the word Bethel. That's where that all took place. That's why I've had that big old rock up here. I believe that we, too, have heard from the Lord and are seeking to be about his business. Now, I began this concluding teaching, uh, the concluding teaching of the series, and I'm talking about part six. Who ever heard tell of preaching a six-part series? But that's what we started a couple of weeks ago. But I began by reminding you of this. What I am reteaching you, and I have been reteaching some things, but what I am reteaching you isn't a methodology. Look at your neighbor and say, it ain't a methodology. Haven't been teaching you a methodology, but rather principles, principles. Now, you youth don't get excited. I didn't say principle like that guy that whips you at school. This is a whole other thing. Principles, kind of like guidelines and so on and so forth. But I'm sharing with you principles that will help us stay on task as we develop strategies for doing what God has purposed us to do going forward. I want to say this again because you can never say it too much. Our message is the same. Our message is the Bible, the Word of God. It's the same. It does not change. I taught you last week and I believe this, it cannot change. You cannot change the Word of God. You could, God forbid, burn this book, rip the pages out, uh, take a, a sharpie and redact some of the comments, cover over some of the comments in there, but you cannot change the Word of God. It is the Word of God and it stays the same. But these, uh, these principles that I'm talking to you about are firmly established on this unchanging Message. In fact, number one on your study notes was filled in uh, during part A. I filled that in for you this morning. Won't charge you any extra for that. But it just says simply our methods and strategies, our methods and strategies for conveying the unchanging message must remain fluid. Now here I'm not talking about methodology, but or, or not talk. Yeah, I am talking about not the message, but the methodology. Our methods and strategies for the unchanging message must remain fluid. Why is that? Why is that? For one, nearly every generation and every culture changes. I went into some detail last week about how kids back in 1973, 4, 5, and 6 when I was in high school, they didn't talk like they do today. Different jargon, different uh, little things that they say and do. In fact, it's very seldom you ever heard anybody uh, in 1973, 4, 5, and 6, you very seldom ever heard anybody mention a cell phone. <laughs> Texting. What the world? So you understand things change. That's why it must remain fluid in terms of methodology. A lot of problems. A lot of problems arise when people of any generation, whether it's the younger generation or the older generation or the in-between generation, a lot of problems arise when these generations or cultures fail to understand the difference between the message, which is static and set, and methodology, which is or can be, perhaps I should even say, should be dynamic or fluid, able to change. I illustrated dynamic methodology by contrasting our text passage. Look again, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. I contrasted that with some unique scenes from the life of Christ. And uh, Hebrews 13, 8 says that Jesus is the same when? Yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same in terms of his character and his virtues, who he is. That doesn't need to change. And yet I put before you the examples from Jesus' earthly ministry when he literally walked around on this terrestrial ball. I, I put before you some examples whereby he performed healing as an example where he performed healing by somewhat random means. I'm not going back into all of that this morning, but you understand there, there's a healing that took place, but he used a different way to get to the healing, different 
methodologies. Fill in number two, or look at number two. Maybe you'll want to underline it or put little squishy marks by it or something to that effect. It's filled in for you. But we stated last week the principles highlighted by our statement of purpose are set. The principles are set. The manner in which each generation facilitates those principles is flexible. Now let me see your eyeballs, especially if you're of the younger crowd. How, how young is that? Anybody under 59? Okay? I'm having a major balloon birthday, a major balloon event coming up uh, here in October. But if you're uh, under 59, if you're a younger person, if you're under 40, perhaps under uh, 20 years of old, I want to challenge you, as I did last week, to always be prayerful about the way God is going to use you to reach your generation. We did not establish New Life Community Church back in 1997 so that we could just continue to do uh, some sort of culture, some same things over and over and over again so that we always look like we did back there. Literally that we always look like we did back there. You with me? All righty. There are five such set principles ensconced within our statement of purpose. Each of them undergirds Bible directives for making disciples and teaching those disciples to obey those directives. That all based upon our secondary text for this particular series, and that is Matthew chapter 28, verses 18, 19, and 20, where we are told to go. Again, we walked you through that last week. I'm not going back through all of that. Now, said that to say this, and I'm slowly but surely winding up my summary, so you hang on. We're going to get to some brand new material very shortly. I have walked you through four of the five points of our statement of purpose. By the way, if you haven't yet or you're new to New Life, if you'll check the back panel of your bulletin, one of those little panels of the bulletin, our statement of purpose is inscribed there. And it says something like this, believing that God has ordained uh, has ordained the establishing of New Life Community Church. We purpose to make disciples for Christ by. And then those five things are listed. First of all is preaching and teaching God's Word. We hammered on that pretty good a few weeks ago. Exalting God through worshipful praise. Building up the other believers in word and deed. In the last part of the series, we talked about equipping the believers for ongoing ministry. And this particular point is very closely connected to it. And that is evangelizing the world for Christ. And that's where we pick up today. Evangelizing the world for Christ. We talked about the, the massive amount of land around this world. And current guesstimates are that there's 7.5 billion people around the world. So that's a daunting task, evangelizing the world for Christ. I attempted to help you understand what we mean by evangelize or evangelizing. And I said to you, first of all, that the word isn't to be found in the New Testament. But there are words that bring to us the concept. Can you say concept? concept. I took you to Acts chapter 16, one of my favorite chapters in all of the, uh, the Word of God. But in Acts chapter 16, I, I tried to help you see the example of Paul and his ministry team as they were headed up kind of northeast and the Holy Spirit checked them uh, by a uh, another vision, Paul had a vision in the middle of the night and the record tells us there in chapter 16 that the whole team concluded that God had called them to preach the gospel in another direction. Now what I wanted you to see was that phrase, preach the gospel. In the original, it's the Greek word euangelizo. How you like that? If you're from Satspaha, it's hard to say that. Euangelizo, what does it mean? It means to preach the gospel, it means something very specific. Uh, look at number three on your study notes. Beloved, it is the expression, not just thoughts, not writings, but the expression, you may want to put it over that uh, word, articulation of some specific and unique truth. The dis didosco, the teaching of Christ, that we went into last week. I'm not going back into it today. Uh, enough said uh, about that other than this. Euangelizo, preaching the gospel, is just telling other people within our sphere of influence. Watch this. Within our sphere of influence. 
Do you know you're influencing people? Either good or bad or indifferent, which according to the Bible is lukewarm and it's bad. All of us have a sphere of influence. I love that. As a pastor, I love being able to say to the congregation, you have a sphere of influence. There are some your family members that you can influence for Christ. Your work associates that you can influence for Christ. Those of you that are still in school, I'm telling you, uh, telling you what I know because way back 40 years ago I was in school and you have an opportunity as a school age child or teenager, you have an opportunity to witness to more people than you probably ever will the rest of your life. There's hundreds and hundreds of them. It's your sphere of influence. And even those people that you run into out in the community that you do not yet know. Preaching the gospel, euangelizo, is just telling other people in our spheres of influence about Jesus' work in our lives. Can you do that? Yes, you can. In fact, you can do that probably better than anybody. What do you mean better than anybody? You can tell other people about Jesus' work in your life better than anybody. You know what he's done for you. You should be able to convey that. We're going to talk about that more here in just a little while. I want you to understand the calling. Going back to Matthew 28, the calling is for each individual believer to connect with the worldwide team of believers that have purposed this together. It isn't your job as an individual to reach all 7.5 billion people. Isn't that good news? Whew, I'd say it is. But it is our calling to be a part of the team that is doing that worldwide. The clear indication from the Bible is this. It's very important to me that you hear this. Clear indication from the Bible is that God has purposed for every single person ever born to be born again. Isn't that good news? Wouldn't it be a bummer if you'd show up here this morning and say, God sent His Son, Jesus, that a few of you might have eternal life. You and you and you, the rest of you can just go to hell. That'd thin your crowd, wouldn't it? But that's not the case. The Bible says it's not God's will that any perish. None. Anyone who has ever been born, it's God's purpose and desire for them to be born Again, now watch this. Once you are born again, and we're going to fill in a brand new study note right here. I want you to fill this in with me. Once you're born again, we begin this transformation process. I believe the Bible's right and true when it says uh, that when you're in Christ, behold, you become a new creature. And that doesn't mean you look different on the outside. That's a bummer for me. <laughs> I was kind of hoping I'd look like Elvis after I got saved, but it didn't happen. But you're made new on the inside. All things are become new and you begin a, a process when that spirit is changed. You begin a mind renewing process with the word and the Holy Spirit. This transformational renewing of our mind. Listen to this. One of the fundamental changes in the thinking of the born again is to consider how to personally engage evangelism. Boy, do you ever find yourself sneaking into church hoping that the preacher won't talk about your personal responsibility? Man, I sure hope he just talks about something fun today like dying and going to heaven. <laughs> and not personal responsibility. Well, we talk a lot about personal responsibility at New Life because we believe the Bible teaches that in particular with regards to evangelism or telling others about Jesus' work or God's plan. By the way, let me say this just parenthetically, and this just kind of come to me as I was studying this week. Evangelism, and I don't know how familiar you are with that word, but evangelism is a key emphasis that makes evangelical or evangelical churches distinct from non-evangelical churches. In the political arena today, the word evangelical has taken on a kind of a negative connotation. That's unfortunate, but it doesn't surprise me because the Bible talks about talk, uh, spreading the good news, telling the good news, evangelism, euangelizo. doesn't surprise me that the political arena today doesn't think much about that. I'll to talk to you more about that in just a moment. I'm shifting gears. Guess what? We're in part B. That was smooth, wasn't it? If I hadn't have told you, you'd have never known it. Here we go. 
I concluded with this two weeks ago before Beth came in and gave you a living illustration of what I'm talking to you about. Wasn't that cool, the way God worked that out? Telling the other people in our spheres of influence about Jesus' work in our lives, watch this, it is not a complex maneuver. For whatever reason, many people who perch on church chairs every week think that sharing their testimony or being a witness for Christ, they, they've been talked into believing, been duped into believing that it is something that is very difficult, very difficult thing, and something that you can't even do unless you've been to cemetery or nary, seminary or something to that effect. Are you with me? How many of you are really here this morning? Can I see your hand? Poke your neighbor. Some of them look like they need poking. <laughs> Hey, listen, I want to suggest to you, so you can debate with me on it if you want to, but I want to suggest to you that communicating the gospel, the good news, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the soon coming of Christ, communicating the gospel isn't usually stymied because of a lack of ability to communicate. The fact that people do not know how to talk do not know what to say, do not have certain knowledge. That's not the case, but rather it's because of a decision to shut it down. Because of a decision to shut it down. What in the world am I talking about? Hang on, I'll try to help you here. Do you know, do you understand that the human frame, and I'm talking about flesh and bones, do you understand that the human frame cannot contain the gospel of Christ? How many of you know God is like this vast, overwhelming supply of water? The most hugestest body of water that you've ever seen in your life. That's God. And for us, in terms of thinking about evangelism or sharing the good news, we're like a water hose. We call them hose pipes back home. I don't know what you call them. It's like a water hose. And can you imagine a water hose trying to take the full brunt of any ocean? Can you imagine trying to push an ocean through a water hose? Well, that's sort of kind of what we're looking at when we're thinking about evangelism. The human frame cannot contain the gospel of Christ, cannot contain all that God is. Now, I'm trying to show you something with this. Jeremiah helps us. Look at chapter 20 and verse number 9. Beloved, once, whole, once the gospel is placed within an individual. Once an individual begins to believe and has their heart changed, their sins forgiven, their spirit renewed, once that's placed there, Holy Spirit starts to boil up and boil over. You believe that? Let me show you. Jeremiah 20 and verse 9. Jeremiah says, But if I say, everybody say if, he says, if I say, I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name. His word in my heart like a, uh, is in my heart like a fire. Look at this, a fire shut up in my bones. You understand what he's saying? If I ever say, I'm not going to talk about God anymore. I'm done with God as a prophet. I'm not talking about him anymore. Jeremiah says, when I think about doing that, it's like a fire shut up in my bones. He says, I'm weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. I cannot. Boy, I know the feeling. There have been one or two Mondays over the years as I've pastored that things didn't go too good on Sunday, didn't turn out like I thought it ought to. Man, I was just... Beloved, we're going to wrap it up there tonight. Can I do so by asking you this? Have you been born again, born anew in the Spirit? You say, Pastor Terry, what in the world does that mean? Jesus said, and you can find this in John chapter 3, Jesus said to a Nicodemus, Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. We all come into this world by a, uh, a physical birth. You know and understand that quite well, I'm sure. But we are birthed into God's kingdom, birthed into his world by a spiritual birth, a spiritual renewal we call being born again. That's what Jesus was talking about. How does that happen? We confess our sins, admit that we have committed wrongdoing against God, and admit that his plan is best. We repent of our sins. You just get so sick of sin, so sick of trying to do it on your own, 
that you realize that won't work. You turn your back on sin, repentance. You open up your heart's door. You believe that Jesus meant what he said. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. You can find this in Revelation. I stand at the door and knock. If any man, can you say any man? Can you say that includes me? Any man will open up his the door. He will come in and, and fellowship with you. Believe that and receive him. Receive him into your life. It's just that simple. Now, beloved, if you've never done that, I encourage you right now to stop and pray. Confess your sins. Admit to God that you're a sinner. In your mind, in your heart, as much as you can, repent of that. Be sorrowful for that lifestyle of sin. Open up your heart and invite Jesus to come in right now, right there where you sit. Will that work? Don't I have to be in a building somewhere? Don't I have to jump through some hoops? Nope, it'll work right there where you are. That's where it can begin. That's the first step, and I encourage you to take that step. By the way, if you do, give me a holler. I would love to hear from you about that. There's some contact information there on the screen. Now, for those of you that claim to be born again, you claim to be a, a, a believer a Christian walking after Christ and seeking God, can I ask you tonight, are you sharing the good news? Are you telling others about what happened to you? And maybe you're one of those that say, you know, Pastor Terry, I did in the beginning. I resemble that remark you were talking about tonight about coming to Christ. I was so excited I was telling people, but something happened to shut it down. Somebody hurt me or somebody hurt my feelings or I just got tired of it. The new wore off, that new Christian smell wore off. Well, let me encourage you to get back to doing what you know God called you to do, sharing the good news. We're to go into the whole world and tell others about Jesus. Tell everyone you know that you know Jesus. I'm doing my part here to do that, and I understand that I've got to, I'm very fortunate to have this medium, but I want to be an encouragement to you to go forth from wherever you may be listening to this and connect with your family members, your friends, your work associates, even those people that you bump into out in the community that you do not know. If you're living for Christ, they're going to see something different in your life, and from time to time they'll ask you about it. You be prepared to tell them. The time has come for sleepy, sleeping, slothful Christians to rise up and begin to do once again what God called us to do. Not berate people or put them down, but to encourage them to come to Christ and find new life in Christ. Father God, I pray for every man, woman, boy, and girl that's listening to this telecast uh, tonight that claims the name of Christ. I pray that you would embolden them to tell everyone they know that they know Jesus. Give us divine appointments, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, again, our t contact information is right there on the screen. We'd love to hear from you. If you made a decision for Christ tonight, or if you just have prayer, or you have some questions about anything we've discussed here on New Life Telecast, give us a call. Contact us through our website. We'd love to hear from you. I'm Terry Knight, the pastor of New Life Community Church, wishing you a great day. Remember, my friends, Jesus is coming back. Is he coming back? <laughs>